Hello, and welcome to the INFORMS RAS Roundtable for 2021. As uh, usual, the uh, roundtable will be presented in two sessions. We'll have a presentation session followed by a brief uh, period of question and answer. Then we'll have a break, and then we will have a discussion session um, where we'll kind of open the floor up let people ask questions of the presenters, let people uh, raise topics, and just have a, a hopefully a lively discussion. During the first session, we'll have presentations by three individuals. Uh, myself, I'm Bruce Patty. I'm with Veritech Solutions. I'm the director of the transportation practice here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been involved with RAS since its uh, initiation back in 1994. I'm a former RAS chair. Um, I've consulted for railroads, CSX, Conrail, Norfolk Southern. And I was also involved as the head of equipment for Pacer Stack Train for about seven years. Uh, the other presenters have a much richer background in our topic, which is trying to increase the, uh, oh, in fact, let me go back to the previous slide here. Sorry about that. The topic of our discussion today is gonna to be improving rail share of intermodal freight. I think it's a topic that all of us consider to be pretty important given the, the importance of intermodal on railroads these days. Sorry about that. The other two presenters are deeply involved in this area. Adrian Bailey, again, another former RAS chair. Um, she's been involved with rail for, for more than 25 years. Leadership roles at Southern Pacific, CSX, and Pacer. She's a former chair of IANA, uh, still deeply involved with IANA. That's the Intermodal Association of North America. And she's currently a, a, a partner at Oliver Wyman. And our third presenter uh, is new to RAS, but he's been involved with rail for over 35 years. Um, Michael Lue, he's currently the CEO of the Alameda Corridor Transportation Authority. Some of you may be familiar with the Alameda Corridor. If the, for those of you that are, are not, I'm sure Michael will be explaining it for us. Um, I know Michael from, from we, we worked together on the uh, rail master plan for the Port of Long Beach back in uh, 2001. Um, Michael's had numerous rail uh, leadership positions involved with transportation studies, and he has key insights into what, um, what, what, is, needs, what rail needs to offer in order to attract uh, more business its way. So, uh, again, the format for today, we'll have the uh, presentations, a brief period of Q&A, and then we'll have a, hopefully a pretty lively discussion during our second, second session. Uh, unfortunately, at the time of the recording that I'm doing now, which is about a month in advance of the conference, I don't actually know when that, these sessions will be taking place. I apologize for that. Let's continue here. What I wanted to do is just give a little bit of background of, of, of why our topic um, about intermodal, uh, why is that so important today? And especially what I wanted to talk about a little bit about is, is the importance of international container traffic for intermodal. A lot of us have experience with domestic intermodal. In fact, seven years I spent at Pacer was focused on domestic intermodal. But I thought that given how close we are to two of the most important ports in the United States, it might be worthwhile focusing a little bit on international container. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Adrian will touch a little bit on that during her talk. And then Michael, I think uh, will have a lot to say about uh, uh, international uh, intermodal traffic. I'll then talk a little bit about factors and customer choice. Adrian will spend a good bit of the time in her presentation talking about this. I'll talk a little bit about how do we improve the odds that uh, customers, that shippers will pick rail. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about, about uh, 
some some steps that that ports are making that demonstrate the importance of rail to ports. Okay. Now, for years, intermodal container volumes were almost entirely composed of international containers because domestic traffic moved via TOFC, that's trailer on flat car for those, for those of you who may be new to this. Uh, and that's where you, in the old days, when we had the piggyback trains, uh, domestic traffic, you actually, uh, you know, you put the, the whole trailer on the back of a flat car. Well, two principal, and so, so while there was domestic traffic moving that way, it wasn't containerized. It was, it was moving in trailers. Uh, two principal developments caused this to change back in the early 80s. One was the development of double stack well cars. This allowed um, basically twice as many containers to be moved for the same length of the train. As many of you know, typically the limiting factor for how much volume one can move on an on a intermodal train is the length of the train, not the weight. And so when they developed the double stack well car, which allowed uh, containers to be stacked one on top of each other and doubled the, the volume that a uh, container train could carry, at least in terms of the number of containers, that is over routes where there weren't certain height restrictions and so on. Um, this allowed the economics to change. Basically, railroads could charge less be, for, to move a, a particular container simply because they could fit so many more on a, on a train. And then secondly, the development of the steel domestic 53 foot container. Um, this allowed it to be, the steel allowed it to be lightweight uh, so that it could compete with the trailer. That is in the eyes of a shipper, when they're shipping uh, freight, there are weight limitations uh, in terms of what can go over the roads. So even though much of the time the containers being spent spends its time on the railroad, when it's being moved by truck to and from the final destination from the rail the rail uh, head, it's got to meet the the road weight limitations. And so, the steel domestic fifty three foot container allowed for heavier shipments because the container took up less of the weight. It allowed for actually heavier weights of the shipments to move. And the steel was much more long lasting than the aluminum containers that, that were being used prior to that. Plus you didn't get the leakage issues that you got with, with aluminum containers. This allowed um, uh, freight to, be sh to, to kind of shift from trailers onto container, on the containers and be moved by, by freight trains um, much more than what was done before. In fact, Pacer was one of the the, the leaders in, in advocacy for the steel container. And now that's pretty much all you see out there. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, for years, intermodal container volumes were almost entirely international containers. But now, intermodal rail volumes are split almost evenly between domestic and international. Both grow in general from year to year, but now it's about a 50-50 split between domestic and international. So you can see how much the domestic freight has grown, but you can see how important international container volume remains. Now, if we think about the international volume for a minute, and we think about, okay, so freight's coming into a port that's coming in on a ship. And if you're trying to, the shipper is trying to determine whether they're going to use rail or whether they're going to use truck to move the freight from the port to its final destination, there's several factors that are key in making that decision. However, the key factor is the distance the freight's going to be moved. As we all know, uh, rail, the longer the move, the higher the economic benefit is to move it via rail. The, the costs are just so much less per mile than they are for a truck. However, 
what it basically comes down to is in a port, the local moves, that is moves that are around the port are just not going to involve rail. It just wouldn't make any sense. So when you've got a port like Los, the port of Los Angeles, the port of Long Beach, or ports in the New York City area, they've got a high percentage of traffic that's just never going to use rail because the, 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 the population in those port cities is so high that there's a large percentage of traffic that's, that's not being moved through to go to inland destinations. It's going to be consumed or its final destination is there in those port cities. So that's not going to involve rail. And then stuff that comes, however, I just step back and say, um, ports like Los Angeles and Long Beach, though, have a high percentage of their freight coming in from China. That's a key, uh, the key ports for, for freight coming in from China. And so when you have long distance moves that are greater than, say, some, some indeterminate X miles, that's going to be less of an option for truck unless the freight's extremely service sensitive. And Adrian's going to get a bit into some of this uh, deciding factors by, by uh, shippers more during her presentation. But I can tell you the factors that determine what this X value is. So, so just think of it, think of it as a band around the port. And that if you're within X miles, if this X is a, the radius uh, reaching out from the port, if you're within this X miles, you're gonna go by truck. If you're greater than X miles, you're gonna go by rail uh, in general. Um, what are the factors that determine X? Well, it's the service and vice, it's, you know, how long is it going to take? It's the reliability. Can you count on how long it's going to take? Or is it going to get hung up somewhere? And the costs. Obviously, like I said, the, the, uh, as you go further and further, the costs start weighing in the, in the benefit of rail. But then the question is, if the service is poor, uh, but the costs are low, then what are the trade-offs? And that somewhat depends upon the um, importance of the freight to the, to, the, uh, to the consumer and to the shipper and kind of their models that they're looking at to help them determine what their, their choices are going to be. So how do we improve the odds? And again, I'm focusing mostly on, on freight that's coming in through ports. How do we improve the odds that rail will win and X can be reduced. Well, we all know that if we want to improve service and reliability, and to a certain extent cost, we need to reduce the handlings. So how can, in an in a, in a international container situation, how do we reduce handlings? Well, I think Michael will go into this in, in some detail in terms of the role of the Alameda Corridor and how it services the ports of Long, Los Angeles and Long Beach, but just think of it as one way you can do this is you can create blocks that bypass downstream handling through use of on dock rail. So for example, if you've got uh, a large quantity of containers that come in on a ship that are destined for, let's say, Chicago, you're coming into the port of Los Angeles and you've got freight that's destined for Chicago then what you can do is a number of the terminals are served by on-dock rail. That is, you can actually build a train right there on the dock. And so what they can do is they can build blocks that go, are going to go all the way to Chicago without needing to be handled afterwards. Or if there's enough freight that's going to someplace like Dallas, they can build a block that's, to, that's going to go all the way to Dallas without any further handling. And they can also build, since it's going to go all the way to Newark or Memphis or any other uh, Eastern cities. So that's one way that, that, uh, that we can reduce handling is by encouraging the use of Von Dock Rail. Another way that, uh, that service can be improved, costs can be reduced, reliability can be increased is by reducing dwell. Dwell, as we all know, takes place primarily when there's a number of hand lanes and you've got to wait for the next train to be connected to. So if we can create consolidation points at near dock terminals, that is maybe, maybe there's not enough 
uh, maybe is it the opportunity to do on duct rail, or maybe there's not a freight to warrant uh, building the block on the train. But if we can create consolidation points at terminals near the dock, where traffic from multiple piers, multiple shipping lines, multiple incoming ships, and so on, can be consolidated, we can create blocks. So for example, there may not be enough freight coming in to one, off one particular ship that's destined for say, a sale location like, um, well, let's just say maybe Atlanta. But if we looked across the multiple piers and we looked at um, all the di you know, different ships that come in and at it about the same point in time, there might be the opportunity to truck from the port to those near dock locations and, it, and to, to that near dock terminal, create the block for Atlanta there because you've got, uh, you can combine for multiple source points and then you can run the Atlanta block out of that location. So the consolidation points can help us create situations that reduce handlings as well. How can we improve consistency? Without consistency, we can't have reliability. Well, one of the things we can do is try to eliminate the shortages that cause backups or overflow of facilities. What's going on right now in many of the ports is the volumes have surged um, and shortages in such things as, as space, such things as chassis, um, things like that cause ports to have to be, I mean, cause ships to have to be held out of the port because if they brought them in, there's no place to, to unload them or, and so on. What that then does is it, it reduces the ability to kind of ha handle volumes with a, uh, with a high service reliability. Another thing that people do to try to reduce costs is reduce empty backhaul moves. So what happens with a lot of freight that's coming into West Coast ports specifically is because of the import export imbalance, there's so much more freight that's imported from China than it's exported, is that uh, when goods come in in the international 20 and 40 foot containers, there's high demand for that, you know, the contents of that freight in the interior of the US, but there's not as much to ship back. And so if you get these 20s and 40s sitting in Chicago or Kansas City or Dallas or whatever, you end up having a lot of empty backhaul moves because you got to get them back to the port to send them back to China to be filled up to bring freight back to the US. Well, what a lot of companies do in, in, to avoid that is they use transloading facilities. They'll take the contents out of those 20 and 40 foot containers, they'll load them in 53 foot domestic containers and they'll ship them in those 53 foot. So you can take the contents of four 40 foot containers and put them into three 53 foot containers. So you use up less of the wells on the train. You can reduce the number of handlings. And when those domestic containers get into those inland locations, the Chicago's, the Kansas cities, the Memphis's, the Dallas's and so on, you don't have to ship them back to the port because they don't have to go back to China. So there's more likelihood that you can find a next move for them as opposed to having to move them empty back all the way to the port because they've got to be loaded back on ships. And then lastly, uh, one of the things that can be done is to, um, to try to reduce costs and help avoid the shortages and so on is create chassis pools. What, it used to be the situation um, that all of the different steamship lines had their own sets of chassis. In fact, some of them viewed it as a competitive advantage. For example, APL used to maintain their own chassis pools and they viewed that as a competitive advantage. And they didn't wanna uh, participate in a pool because they wanted to kind of control uh, that there be enough chassis for the containers that were coming in on their vessels. Well, you can imagine though, if, if every steamship line has their own set of sets of chassis that you can, um, well, one, there's a whole lot more chassis than you need than if you can get the economies of scales by pooling, you can run into situations where you've got plenty of red chassis, but you're short of the yellow chassis 
And so um, at the rail terminals, uh, you know, they, 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 they can't load all, you know, unload all the trains they'd like to load or they have to go to the ground because they don't have chassis of the right color. By color, I, I'm referring to that, that's representing the different steamship lines. So what happened back in the mid 2000s was the ports all decided to, uh, well, first the steamship lines decided they didn't want to be in the chassis business. So they started looking for people to buy their chassis fleets from them. They decided they wanted to be in the business of moving containerized freight and not in the business of having to maintain chassis pools. And then secondly, what happened was the people that bought the chassis decided to combine them in, into pools so that they could get economies of scale. And in fact, here in the LA area, they have what's known as the pool of pools because there used to be several different pools that served different steamship terminals and then, oh, I would say seven or eight years ago, they created the what they call the pool of pools, which allows for um, uh, chassis to, to be moved between the different pools or participate in the different pools. This allows a reduction of unnecessary truck moves. So you're not having to, to um, you know, if a, if, a, if a trucker is takes, say you've got one of these off dock or near dock consolidation points, a trucker comes in, picks up a container, takes it to, let's say, the ICTF, and now he's going to take something from ICTF out. But he's not going to take it to the same steamship line that he came from. He wants to go to a different steamship line. It used to be that they had to find some place to go put that chassis and then go pick up another chassis, one of the right color, as I was saying early, earlier on, uh, to, to haul it back to the appropriate uh, terminal. Um, by using the chassis pools, you don't have to worry about those kinds of things. If you've got a 40 foot chassis, you bring in a 40 foot container, they take it off the back of your chassis, that trucker moves, can move to a different location. They can put a different 40 foot container. It doesn't have to be going to the same steamship line. He can take that back to another steamship line and they can load out the train. So this allows reduction of unnecessary truck moves, reduces congestion, reduces costs and so on. Okay, so how can we can improve the odds is we can do things that, that help reduce the handling, reduce the dwell, improve consistency, reduce costs. Now you may think that the, the steamship lines are somewhat neutral on this, that they wouldn't care whether it's trucks that get used or whether it's rail that gets used because they're there to serve the steamship line. But recent, steps that the, that the ports have made, and I'm sure Mike can go into more of this, either in his presentation or by answering some questions on this topic. So they've taken recent steps to kind of demonstrate that's not the case. So not um, neutral on this. Well, one, they want to reduce pollution from idling trucks. You can imagine if you've got uh, all these trucks waiting at the gates to come in and pick up containers that uh, you've either got a lot of pollution from them just sitting there idling or, or, or not necessarily, or you've also got, and you've got a congestion at, at the gates and on the road serving the terminals. I remember when we were doing the, um, the uh, master plan work that I mentioned earlier on back in 2001. If you came driving down the, uh, the Long Beach freeway, you would just see truck after truck after truck lined up at the gates or, or on the freeways waiting to get into the, to the, uh, the ports. If you're able to use rail, especially on dock rail, you can reduce this kind of congestion and reduce the number of trucks that are being used, reduce the pollution from the idling trucks and so on. That's one of the reasons why, why rail is so important to the ports. I'm sure Michael can illuminate us on some of the other ones. And to demonstrate how important this is, this is these ports are making significant investments to improve the access to rail options. Just recently, the Port of Los Angeles, which currently has th about 35% of the container moves use a rail network, 26% using on-dock rail, 
they've invested over $300 million over the last year in their rail infrastructure. The Port of Long Beach recently approved an $870 million package to improve on-dock rail. Their goal, they're currently about the same kind of percentages as the Port of Los Angeles. Their goal is to increase the use of rail to 50%. And they've recently signed a pact with the state of Utah. Utah's kind of on that border of where that X value is. If you've got stuff going to Salt Lake City, you could truck it from LA or you could move it via rail to LA. Well, to try to get that X value down the, um, so that it would go via rail, there's re been a recent pact uh, developed between the Port of Long Beach and the state of Utah to increase the use of rail for goods headed there. So this is just some background information for why is inter international container traffic coming in through the ports important for rail? Why is it important to increase the, the volume that, that moves via rail via truck if railroads are going to um, increase the amount of intermodal traffic given that it's currently 50% of the volume that's moving on, on rail. And what are some of the things that need to be done, again, at a very high level to improve the odds that shippers will select rail? At this point in time, I will pause for a brief Q&A session if there are any, and then we'll turn this over to our next speaker, Adrian Bailey. Thank you for your attention.